Okay, now I'm going to cover risk pooling. This is a pretty important concept as we go forward because next week we're going to deal with supply, uh, designing sub supply networks. And part of it is going to be basically um, aggregating parts of your supply chain. Because what happens, um, for the most part, most supply chains that you deal with are, are, are going to be local. Okay, but when you start looking at regional or national or international supply chains, the complexity of a giant supply chain is such that you have to simplify it. And uh, risk pooling is a very important concept of simplifying supply chains by aggregating um, demand within a supply chain. And, and I'm going to go through this right now. So, first example, let's say we have multiple warehouses and we have uh four retailers that are fed by four separate warehouses okay so um in, in this example average demand per site is 30 and the standard deviation um i'm assuming everybody understands what standard deviation is it's the variation from the from the average or the mean okay so so the standard deviation is 10. so um let's say that we want to be sh ensure that we could support provide products to 99.8% of the expected demand. So that would be uh, three sigma from the mean. So um, the, the demand, the inventory required for each site to meet this expected demand would be um, 30. So it would be 30 um, plus the three sigma worth of standard deviation. So it'll be another 30. Uh, this is a very undisciplined supply chain, uh, obviously. So we would have to have 60 units per site. So the distribution center would have to make sure that the, that, that the warehouses have a total of 240 units of inventory to, to, to meet the expected demand of, of retailers A, B, C, and D. Does everybody understand how that works? Okay. How about you, Diotis? Does that make sense to you? Okay, wonderful. So now, when we risk pool, the basic concept is we're going to move the warehousing to address as many retailers as possible, and the effects are pretty significant. So let's say that we get rid of three of the four warehouses, now we only have one warehouse supplying four retailers. So now, the, ex the expected demand per, per site is still 60 units. Okay, we haven't, we haven't changed that. But what has happened is we have aggregated the variance. And what that does is um, basically um, the variance of aggregate demand is equal to the sum of the variances of the individual demands when the depend demands are independent. In basic English, the, the variance of all the demands put together, the variation within the ver of when you pull multiple demands, and you, and you um, average them out. The, the amount of variation within those demands is equal to the sum of the variances of each individual demand as long as the demands are independent of each other. We're saying that each of these four retailers have factors uh, affecting demand that are independent of the other three. That's very important. If for some reason the demands are not independent, let's say retailer A and B, let's say retailer A and B share the same demographic. Well, statistically speaking, they don't have independent demands. So as a result, you've just injected uh, error into your variation. Okay. So um to calculate the variation when you um aggregate the demand it's really simple if you look at the bottom block uh down here you you basically sum all the variances so the demand variation at each location we're just going to square the standard deviation so the, the demand variance is 100 okay um now we're going to add up all the variation so that's 400, and we're going to take the square root 
of the sum of all the demand variances. Okay. So you have uh, 400, the square root of 400 is 20. So now, instead of having to have 240 units, we basically, um, we basically say that the standard variation of each of the retailers when they share the same warehouse and their demands are independent is 20. So now what we need, so it's down here, now what we need to provide the supply uh, for, the, for the retailers to be kept at warehouse A is, is your original demand, which is 30 per site, plus 20 times four, which is 80. So now, as a total, we need 180 units kept at warehouse A. Now note that the, that the average demand per site is the same and the standard deviation per site is the same. But basically what we've done is we've aggregated the demand across four retailers. And the general theory behind this is the theory that if one retailer receives a higher than expected demand, another retailer will, ex will have a lower than expected demand. Now, there are some flaws in this that have to be, be assumed. Like for instance, um, one, uh, one of the, one of the uh, classmates talked about seasonality of demand. Uh, during high season, if your demand spikes, as long as your demand spikes across all the sites at the same time, and the demands upon each site is different, you're okay. But if let's say retailer, um, well, so if, if say retailer D has a sudden high, high season, um, it, it's, a, it, it's assumed that the other three will not, okay? If you have a seasonality effect that affects all four, you don't have independent demand variation all of a sudden, okay? So let's say we're in four parts of the country and one or even two of, of the sites had suddenly get a spike due to seasonality, let's just say. As long as the other two are not, or the other three are not, we're okay, okay? But for the, um, well, actually the more that, suffer from the seasonality, the worse it is. Your accuracy of your aggregation decreases the more people share. So if you have one, uh, let's say retailer D's in Florida selling condos in the summer, their seasonality spikes. As long as the three don't spike, you're okay. Okay, the three sites basically absorb that variation. Okay, but when more than one site has has an increase, then you, the, the, the ability for you to risk pool, to pool the risk across multiple sites decreases. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, I'm going to assume that it does. If, if it doesn't, let me know. Oh, oh so, okay, Those, that means that independent demand should be unique to each retailer. Yes, that is correct. Correct. Um, the, the demand should be unique to each retailer. Now, in a real world, is it 100% independent? No, obviously. Um, but the more independent the demands are, the more accurate your risk pooling is. Okay, um, that's, that, that's important. Um, so this is our way of simplifying a supply chain network. Um, you can see an example in week three where you have like 500 or a thousand retailers and you got to say, okay, how are we going to su provide supplies to all these areas? Treating each one of those as a separate demand can be very daunting and can be very expensive for a, for a company. So you use risk pooling and there's software that helps us out. Okay. Um, I'll talk about more about that next week, but I usually, when you, when you deal with localized supply chains and you're doing this kind of, of strategy, I always recommend that you do it on paper and you do it by hand so you can um, understand it better. So, um, 
Are there any questions? You can go ahead and go off mic if you want, Mark, and uh, ask a question if you ever need to. Um, I'll actually go on mic, sorry. Um, okay, so how do you account for seasonality in all sites? The Virginia Beach. Should that affect anything because this cross all retail during every year be planned for the ordering? Um, well, and this is the thing. Um, this depends on your forecasting. If you're forecasting a seasonal, let's say you have a forecast rate that's um, three months. Um, as long as, say, Virginia Beach spikes and the other three sites don't spike, then uh, the theory of variance and aggregate demand will say that when Virginia Beach spikes, the other three will absorb the variation. They'll have less demand. Does that make sense? And let's say you have Virginia Beach and California. Well, if both of those spike, then that should tell you, okay, I need to treat those separately. I cannot aggregate the demand because you have a common variable that causes the variation in multiple sites. It's not to say that it won't be, that you can't do it, it's just that the accuracy of your risk pooling will be decreased, okay? Risk pooling assumes that over your forecast time, the variation averaged across all four sites here will be 60 units. One may have 100, and the other ones will have less. Okay. Um, actually, it, it wouldn't be, yeah. So, um, so like, for instance, they would say, like, for instance, if, say, Virginia Beach is D and it goes up to 80, it's going to assume that the other months are going to have less. Okay. Does that make sense? Because your average demand is 30. So you're going to say, well, one month you may have 60 or 50 in Virginia Beach, but the other months might have 20 or 10, 15, you know. Um, overall, um, the more accurate your standard deviation, the smaller the standard deviation, the more accurate your risk pooling will be. And the more independent each demand is, the more accurate your risk pooling will be. Does that make sense, Deotis? Okay. Um, if, uh, once again, I'm making some assumptions that um, everyone's comfortable with general statistical theory um, and, and is generally comfortable with the math here, but if I need to create something in the, in the class to go through this more, please feel free to email me, um, and I'll be more than happy to uh, try to put something together for you guys. So, Okay. That's, the, that's, that's probably the most important concept of, of week two that you'll need going forward.